Okay, welcome, folks. Welcome, welcome to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Uh, this is the 274th edition of Changing Reality, the most important things. It is October the 10th, the year of our Lord, 2013. And it's Thursday night, and that's usually when we have Black Star Thursday. And we, we got the man himself, one of just a handful of people who still keep in track of this uh, Black Dwarf Star. So, Tara, why don't you come on in here and give, give us an update on the, or the Black Dwarf Star. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, first of all, then people like Jim Mars, he was been a friend of mine, gave me advice, like a dad, and um, that's what you get on the Internet. You know, that was his message to me, and it's true. That's the way it goes. And um, it's very difficult to try to build the type of, a research group and organization that you are trying to do on the internet, and um, whether you can go to somewhere else or so. Let, let's let's give a little Black Star update, but in the in the knowledge that this is entertainment, this is really entertainment for most people. Now, th this is like going into Sodom and Gomorrah as one of the two witnesses, and you're there to just tell the truth and to let everybody know, you know, what's going on. But you know. How it's going to be received is one thing, but we're working for a reward that's in heaven. You know, what's happening here is not even real. This is like a matrix, and we're going somewhere else. We're already there, actually, and uh, our dedication to the truth is what matters, not uh, the compensation or you know or anything. And whenever we're doing it, in the knowledge that it's not really even going to be received, imagine, you know, like Noah building his ark, 120 years he was ridiculed, and it was entertainment. For 120 years, the people that came out, this guy building a gigantic boat out in the middle of nowhere, you know, expecting it to start raining. Some of these people had never even seen rain in their life, right? That's the people he's testifying to. But he was laughed at, mocked, and everything. Oh, uh, you're right, goes. Terrell. He was a tourist attraction. When people came through yeah. that territory, they go, "Listen, we got a store for you. This guy's got this huge boat he's building. You got to see this." And you can just imagine the people that came out just to see it. You're right, entertainment. Yeah, and animals that he was bringing in and all, you know, you can just imagine it was a spectacle. So there's people showing up every day, you know, they've got their own special spot, and they're, you know, like at a baseball game, and they're mocking the umpire, they're mocking the catcher, the pitcher, you know, that's their job, that's what they do every day. That's what Noah endured for 120 years, and so at least our time is shorter, but what we're saying, you, you're right in your commentary that you say that the black star is the, is the master key to understand everything. Everything is explained by what's coming from space. The warnings from NASA, even the USGS, the, uh, the warnings are coming from everywhere. That They're expecting the power grids to go down. Um, underground arc cities are built. China's are ancient. China is ahead of everybody else in preparation for what's about to happen. Oh, they yes. Have they're, they're, they're storing up grain and food like by bulldozer. I mean, like crazy. There's a thousand gold, data points. Gold and silver and you know, commodities, the things that they need. And that they, they're saying that China owns a lot of U.S. debt, but they really don't because they're trading it for land in South America and in Africa so they can have access to more commodities. They're really playing this really smart. The average person walking around doesn't even know what we're talking about, though. What we're talking about is there's something coming from space, and it appears to be a binary twin to our sun. This is really a big deal of what's about to happen. So the reason that you're seeing these drills about the grids going down, the you're seeing the government acting very strangely. You know, the, they shut down the government. They should have shut it down in 2008, actually. But the, now they're shutting it down. It's going to come back up. There's going to be a 2014 Earth orbit cycle going around the sun in part of 2015 before my projections say that the thing's going to get here and begin terraforming the planet. And the, the thing that's coming from space is extremely insidious. The, this is the pattern that is revealed because we have two uptick periods, earth change uptick periods that are very predictable. We know when they're going to start and we know when they're going to end. And then we're going to have a lull period. The first one is for two months. The second one is for a little over three months. We're about to enter it right now. Now, this is very predictable, right? But um, the point is that there is a clear pattern. There is something coming 
from space. It's in the Virgo constellation right now on the left side, just below the plane. It is moving into Libra. And by the time this thing gets to the left side of Libra, it's going to be, it's going to cross Earth, or, Earth orbit path. There are many indicators that tell us that's true. Is it, so let's talk about the pattern just a little bit. Then I'll give you this update. And then, uh, Hijacker, I know, has a lot of questions on, uh, and I think that this shows particularly is going to go into a lot of different areas. Okay, so where we are right now on October the 10th is we are behind the sun relative to the black stars. So if you look right directly to the sun, you're looking at the Virgo constellation on the left side. That's where we are right now, and that's where the object is. So we're expecting a Ring of Fire Pacific Ocean event, every single event since 2004 that has taken place on the 188-day cycle, which is now longer, has been a Pacific Ocean Ring of Fire event. So last week... Robert asked about uh, what's going, you know, the earthquakes, the 7.7 and stuff, Pakistan. That's not even related. It is on the regular seismic cycle. It's part of the regular seismic cycle. The, the extraordinary quake that happens every now and then was 6 magnitude in 2011, 7 magnitude, and now it's getting close to 8 magnitude. That's why you're seeing 7.7s now that are actually much more powerful. But the USGS, you know, they're downgrading all the quakes so as not to alarm you and to wake you up to the realization that you're living in a 2012 movie that's happening in slow motion. But Hijacker and I are very aware, keenly aware, that there is something happening here and there's a pattern. Hijacker and I disagree about the timing. Um, he seems to think that it's happening sooner rather than later, and I know that it's happening later. 2015 orbit cycle is what we're looking at. That this black star moving left in the orbit diagram means that, well, if you take the calendar and the orbit diagram and our events, they are turning around left on the orbit diagram and moving later in the year. So February 2010, that's whenever Chile happened, 8.8 .8 earthquake, three-inch Earth, Earth axis shift, right? The next year was Fukushima. You see how it's moving from February 27th, 28th over to March 11th. Next year was Guerrero. You had an Earth axis shift of four inches with Fukushima. But here's the deal. When this thing is at a certain distance away, say Jupiter orbit and just a little bit inward, then we have the maximum effect from the black star. And the reason is because the electromagnetic effect is – that's what's messing with us. The sun is also a gigantic, powerful electromagnetic source. So we're receiving – extreme amounts of electromagnetism from the sun all the time through the magnetic portal connection. It's like a giant umbilical cord that runs from the sun to the earth, connects and disconnects on eight-minute cycles. You can Google NASA magnetic portal connection and read all about it. 2008 is whenever they came out with most of the information. They revisited it in 2011, 2012 because they realized the earth is receiving subatomic particles much faster than through the solar wind. There's another source, and so – some of the astrophysicists and stuff, they're looking at magnetic portal connections for the next explanation. And what they're eventually going to do is they're going to defeat the hypothesis, the theory, the current explanation that Earth's magnetosphere is created by the Earth core, which it is not. It is created by the sun in this magnetic portal connection. So once you realize that everything is connected, the sun is connected to the Earth through this magnetic portal connection, this is the source of our magnetic protection, our our magnetosphere, for example. Okay, the heliosphere is a gigantic electromagnetic bubble that surrounds our solar system. It has shrunk by 25% in just one decade. Our magnetosphere has been weakening for the last two decades. And so there's, a, you know, whenever you look at the sun weakening its output and the earth weakening magnetosphere, the heliosphere shrinking, you should realize that all these things are connected. The magnetosphere has two primary features. The bow shock that always faces the sun, it's compressed by the solar wind, and then the magneto pause or the tail, that is like the lady's hair that's blowing always away from the sun like a comet tail. It's always facing away from the sun. On March the 12th and 13th, 2012, write those dates down, March 12th and 13th, 2012, the bow shock turned around and faced the Virgo constellation for about 28 hours, right? So that's impossible unless you have another source of subatomic particles superior to the solar wind, right? And the, the information was not read, readily available. You have to Google, like, suspicious observers, 
March 12, 13, 2012, magnetopause reversal, they were characterizing the event as. It's not actually a magnetopause reversal. That phrase infers that the, the source was the sun or the earth. And the, what, the cause, the thing that turned the magnetosphere around was not the sun nor the earth. It was this body that's coming from the Virgo constellation and the magnetic portal connection that is running. See, as this star gets closer, it has a magnetic portal connection to the sun also. And this is the, the reason for the insidious nature of what's happening to us. Okay. If you go back, let's say a hundred years and you look at the solar cycles, you see a, it's, it's a sine wave. It goes up and down and up and down. You have a maximum and in between the peaks of the maximums is nine to 12, maybe 13 years. If you go back over a hundred years. Okay. Well, that pattern was broken now with solar cycle 24. Solar cycle 24 spiked at the end of 2011 and then it flatlined. It went down. Now the sun output, the solar output is about a third of what it should be. The number of sunspots. It, whenever you look at the emissions, the, the radiation from the sun and the sunspots, they follow the same curve, right? Well, the sunspot curve went down and flatlined to about a third what it should be, and NASA is saying that the sun is going to reach solar maximum. It's not going to happen. Whenever the sun, you go back in history and you can look at the photos of, of recent history anyway, and you can see that as the sun reaches solar maximum, you have two lines of sunspots 30 degrees above and below the equator. That's a common feature of every single solar maximum that's ever happened. Now, they're saying that that's that event, the, the uh, poles, the magnetic poles of our sun are going to flip. They say it's going to happen any time now, but we do not see the 30 degree line, the, the sunspots rotating around the sun at 30 degrees above and below because the internal pressure inside the sun is not present. Now, the reason that that is not present is because there's another source, there's another body, another star nearby that is siphoning energy off of our sun. That's the reason the heliosphere is shrinking. That's the reason that the sunspots are not present on our sun reaching solar maximum. And that's the reason that the sun will not reach solar maximum because the electromagnetism, that energy that is builds up and builds up to a maximum and then the poles flip, is the internal pressure is not there. The electromagnetism is being siphoned off by another star. As this star gets closer and closer and closer and closer, then the the inside of that magnetic portal connection, you have active conduits and you have passive conduits that line the perimeter. Okay, so the passive conduits are like vacuum um, tubes. They can they're they're conducting nothing and they insulate what's happening on the inside, the electromagnetism. We're talking about tons and tons and tons of electromagnetism of subatomic particles that are being pushed through that that uh, magnetic portal connection. Right. And so as the star gets closer, then the magnetic portal connection between the sun and this black star, it disconnects and then it reconnects with a higher percentage of the internal conduits becoming active. Right. And as it happens, the, di the internal core, the, the active conduits, right, more and more of them become active and then they reach the outer wall of the magnetic portal connection, which means that that connection no longer has insulation. So as other magnetic portal connections, like the one running from the Earth to the Sun and the one running from the black star to the Earth, as these guys cross one another, then they begin cross-firing. That causes the electromagnetic clouds out there pushing towards the Sun that create the solar flare threat. See, so there's there's lots and lots of patterns here that say there's something coming from space. And we can tell when the solar flares are going to happen because we know when the magnetic portal connections are going to cross. And you see what I mean? Whenever, for example, March the 11th, 2011, that's whenever Fukushima happened, right? The nine-pointer that caused the four-inch Earth axis shift. One year and one day is the day that the magnetosphere flipped around the next year on March the 12th, 2012, right? The re these two events are connected because 
the alignment that was expected, in other words, when the sun and the earth and the black star are in a straight line, you see, that is predicted to be March the 22nd, which turned out to be March the 20th, right, with the Guerrero event. But the days leading up to that event, the earth was getting ready to pass between the two stars. The magnetic portal connections were creating small angles near the black star and near the sun. You see, now as they get closer and closer, almost to make a straight line, the cross firing begins that creates the electromagnetic clouds, and one of those clouds turned the magnetosphere around. So the magnetosphere flipped around not because of direct influence from the black star. It was created by the magnetic portal connections crossing, and then the, it's like your arms, just put them straight out in a straight line and then bring them together and clap. Well, as they're about to clap, you have a small angle, and there's no room in between for all this electromagnetism, and that causes the ejection towards the sun, which the sun interprets as a foreign body like the Earth, surrounded by electromagnetism, you see. So that's what causes the solar flares, and that is what the reason that NASA and everybody in the world is warning about solar flares, the kill shot, and the power grids going down. So this happens at the alignments. And whenever the Earth, the Sun, and the Black Star are in a straight line. So when you go back in time, you look at the pattern. You see the the Chile event, the Fukushima event, Guerrero event, Papua this year. You're watching the Black Star moving left in the orbit diagram. Right now it's under the butt of Virgo, moving towards the legs. And it is going to move into Libra. It's moving about 15 degrees per year right now. It was 11 degrees during the 180-day cycle period. Now it's 15 degrees, and it's going to continue to get larger. The next alignment event is predicted to be April the 26th, 2014. Yeah, we, we still got the, we got the October 10th to the 12th. We're supposed to have some kind of quake, a pretty good-sized uh, shaker, uh, next couple of days, right, Terrell? That's exactly right. Just like Aleutian event last year, 7.9, Fiji the year before, and Christchurch the year before. We're expecting that event to happen any moment. Okay, well, hang on, Terrell. Uh, we'll be right back in just about two minutes. But why don't you go ahead and give out your information where they can get a hold of you, you know, because I know after the cycle goes quiet, you're going to go quiet for a couple of months. So why don't you give your stuff out? Go ahead. Okay. Um, Terrell03.com. You can get the newsletters for free. One comes out every Thursday. One came out today, volume number 41. And you can get it all for free just by click, going to terrell03.com. Click on the 2013 little button thingy there in the header, and you have the link to the Dropbox folder, and then you can have access to the information. People that want more, they want threat assessment reports. They want it to converse back and forth through emails, through Skype, and this and that. They become subscribers. They pay $25 a year to support the research. But like Hijacker says, say, I've been doing this. This is in my first rodeo. I've been doing this a while. And the support's just not going to be there, Hijacker. You, you have to do it for the love of the research and scale your operation down so that you can guess just like I'm guessing with you. Maybe I'll be guessing with Robert or um, Robert Papino I'm talking about and or somebody else, you know, that picks up the torch and goes with it. But it's going to be because of the love of the truth and your reward in heaven that you do it. Not because of the reward that's here because trust no, you me, don't, you don't understand it's, it's not going to be there. And um, you're doing it for the love of the truth, what's on the inside of you, knowing the truth and trying to share that with people. When we're standing in heaven looking back on this dark period, then we're going to reward ourselves and be rewarded by our friends and those that love us for just standing upon the truth while we're surrounded by darkness. This is a crucial time in what's about to happen. Because what's about to happen is the sons of God, the ones that judge the world and the angels are about, well, they're about to come to action. They're going to sit in the heavenly places. The day of the Lord is about to begin. This is a very great period that's about to start. But preceding that light of that day of light is this time of darkness. And it's just like, you know, the, the darkest part of the night is just before the dawn. And that's the, what we're entering right now. We, we can't expect people to see what we're trying to show them when God is the one that's blinding them. Remember what Christ said, Matthew 7, started 13, few are on the road to life, on the path to life, walking through the narrow gate. The many are on the road to destruction, and the many is what you get. So <laughs> that's just the sad reality of the way it goes. But if you're doing it for the love of the truth, then you have cheer in your heart. 
knowing that, you know, like Jesus Christ walked around in sandals all his life. You know, the lawyers and the, the people that were uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the people that were in great garments, they were the ones trying to kill him. That's the way it works. So if you're going to be a member of Christ's body, then you're going to participate in his suffering. And sometimes that means knowing exactly what the truth is and trying to share it and it just not being accepted and not being supported. That's what you're suffering through right now. But um, you, like like myself, these radio shows are, are ending now with the uptick period. There may be one more is all that I have in me, too. But this stuff wears you down, hijacker. You, you know that. And right now you're worn down. So I hope the listener realizes that, that Hijack has been on a long run. He he began doing radio shows after listening, I believe, the 2011 Orbit Cycle, Ellen and Orbit Cycle, and listening to Revolution Radio, just like you guys, and became involved listen, hearing my radio shows, waking up, and now he sees it. And he is one from the radio crew, Deacon John, Earth Play, Hijacker, Natalie, several others. Then Hijacker is the one that stood up and carried the torch for this period, but it does wear you down, Hijacker. You're not really yourself right now. Well, no, no, actually, Terrell, I'm not. I'm not worn down. I, I would love to be able to do the six hours at night, but I know what it would take, and I got nothing else to trade. Your presentation is wonderful. It's the receiving end that we're talking about. Uh, the, uh, the the typical person hearing this show, their attention span is well below four minutes. And, and you're trying to do a six-hour show, so um, I think that that you need to you know, rethink and do your research and share it as a guest, you know, for a little while, and and build upon that, build upon you know a little bit of success, and carry it from there. But your expectation is much too high for your goal. Your goal is set way too high, which is great, you know, to have to shoot for the stars. All right, but you, you may hit the moon. <laughs> it's something that's closer. But um, I, I sense it in your voice, knowing you for quite some time, that you need a little rest, and then you'll be revitalized when the earth changes. They're going to kick up after January the 15th. We're going to see a sudden rise again, moving towards another Solomon Island-like event like we had on February the 6th. We're going to have a pair of sevens that happen right after that period, and that's going to be the time that you're going to see me back on the radio sharing with you guys. I'm trying to help you see the pattern, all right? So, you know, that's you know that's my advice to you. Lower the expectation a little bit, and um, do the research, and and then do what your heart tells you to do. Stand inside your heart, to stand upon the truth, and share it to the best of your God-given ability, knowing that the mystery of iniquity, Second Thessalonians two, started verse seven, the mystery of iniquity, that the deluding influence forces people to believe what is false so that they may all be judged, not even for things they did in this world, for things they did during the Satanic Rebellion as gods in another realm. So this is like if you saw the movie The Thirteenth Floor. This is the simulation that we're running. This is not even real. But this is exposing all the lies, all the, you know, this, that when it goes along with the Satanic Rebellion. Infinite beings, infinite gods being judged as finite beings over a series of lifetimes, over ages. That's what we're living through right now. Okay, so that, I mean, that's my view. That's what I've done, had to do in the past. I think I'm a little ahead of you on the curve on that. And uh, whenever, you know, we expect, we, we expect too much from the listeners, you know, from the people that we're trying to help, then we can become very disappointed and disillusioned. At the same time, so I think that if we look back at the research, at the truth, and stand on that, and share to the best of our God-given ability as a guest, you know, talk to Robert. I'll guest with him if he'll have me, and then you know you can do the same thing, and you know if he'll you know, and then you have the opportunity to share. Then you're going to have uh, the the satisfaction that you need without having the high um, overhead. We do what we can, and God does the rest. You know, and that's it. And and we just do the best we can, and, and we're going to be satisfied with that. So um, where we are on the cycle, on alignment, if you look directly at the sun at noon, beyond the sun is the black star in the Virgo constellation. That's where the sun is relative to the earth. And um, we see the M-class flares. We're, it, the pattern that I was feeling was going to happen is a little about a week later. 
the the M class flares that we're seeing now, trans, they were supposed to transition to X's for like now, and they're not doing it yet. And um, what I say in my update video at, at you know on the YouTube channel, what's in the newsletter, is that I'm losing the ability to give you guys accurate predictive modeling. I'm losing it. The uh, the uptick periods were clearly identifiable. The two they began last year on December the 28th. They ran through the alignment on um, April the 6th and into the crossing event on May the 17th. So we had more indicator quakes, 2.5 to 4 magnitude, in that week, and it was predicted on May and May around May the 20th. That's more. That's 150 higher than average, and that's about 60 higher than any other week of the year. It's very predictable. The reason is because we're crossing orbit path of the object that's coming from Virgo, right? So next year it's going to be about 15 days later, right? Well, we're going to see that this is the data that we're gathering that gives us the, uh, you know, what I just said is inaccurate. May the 17th was moved out to May the 20th, and I expect that date to stay the same. The elliptical curve that this thing is on is pointing towards May the 20th. In other words, where the Earth is in orbit around the sun on May the 20th, which is between the sun and the left side of the Libra constellation. Now, that is the point in space. That's the farthest that the Earth can grow crossing its orbit path. So if you take the orbit path of this thing, it has a perihelion position nearest the sun going maximum velocity, right? And then it has an aphelion position on the far end of the orbit. Whenever you draw a line between those positions and the sun, you have – a bilateral symmetry. You have left side and right side, inbound and outbound, that that are identical. Okay, and they have matching velocities, and you know, just like every other object that orbits around the sun. So there, the point is that there are many indicators telling us where this object is, and for me, when it's going to get here, which is crossing orbit path May the twentieth, two thousand and fifteen. So the uh, the warnings, the uh, the exercises, the grids going down, and all that. What you're looking at is a combination of many things that's going on. Let's imagine for a second that you are the House of Rothschild, that you have more money than everybody else in the world combined. You own all the central banks in the world, including the Federal Reserve, Central Bank of Russia. All right, they're siphoning wealth off all the countries that way. But let's suppose that you have all the resources in the world and you know there's a black star coming that's going to terraform the planet what are you going to do you're going to create underground arc city programs and that's exactly what's going on mimicking what has been going on in turkey for example there it's like china they have underground cities that and they have drills I'm not kidding you friends of mine they were in china all of a sudden it's like a fire alarm horns going off they're in this little place that has a bar, and the bar is slid over. There's steps. They all run underground. That's what they're doing in China, like air raids you know, during the war. They're preparing for what's coming, but the typical person walking around, for example, if you live in Norway, but they have room in their underground arc city for about half the population, about 2.5 million. In the United States only – it's about 17 million moving towards 20. And then in Russia, it's over 30 million now, but they have underground pressurized arc city programs for the elite. Now, this explains – this is part of the Rothschild program, the underground arc city program. This is connected to Rothschild, Gates, Rockefeller, eugenics, the chemtrailing that's going on. That All this stuff is connected. HARP is connected to this, the super soldier program. This is all connected together. Because they know what's happening and they're doing threat assessment. They're trying to figure out who Lone Wolf is so Lone Wolf doesn't get inside the underground arc city and kill them all. Because the same technology they're using against us, we're talking about biological weapons, can be used against them. And Lone Wolf can do it to them. Just one. See, that's the threat, the primary threat to the underground arc city program. The reason that information is being gathered against you right now and being fed to, to, well, it's artificial intelligence for running simulations. The reason for it is because of child and threat assessment and identifying the threats against the New World Order. The New World Order, when you hear that phrase, it's a reference to, it's a 
characterization of what's going to happen after the Black Star gets here. The Georgia Guidestones, just Google it. You know, 500 million people are going to live through this chaos, this terraforming of our planet. And the system for controlling them is already in place. There's multiple rings, the harp rings, that surround our planet at the equator. They, they, they've they been launching that for the last two years. There, there was uh, 240, about 240 harp stations around the world. Now that number is, is high, over 300. And the new ones are in safe zones around the equator. But the reason, if you want to Google 1,400-hour multi-line resonation anomaly, the reason is because they are bringing online artificial intelligence and his ability to interact with the nanites that are inside your body right now. The chemtrailing. You have nanomaterials inside your body that responds to the input of artificial intelligence that is working from a stable simulation that has a you inside of it that's the reason they need your facebook information your contact information because they have a little you and they're reverse engineering using artificial intelligence to the heart medium multi-frequency on top of the 1.5 hertz carrier wave 7285 feet tall and sometimes they multi-frequency six of these giant carrier waves together for a six-week period it happened around 9 11 happened for six weeks in 2012 and it could happen at any time. Oh yeah, well you know, Terrell, I didn't used to believe you about the nano, uh, the nanobot uh, technology uh, in your gut, and that they, they have such kind of high technology. Until I heard Steve Quayle and Dr. Bill Deagle talk about, um, you know, they basically did a Vulcan mind melt on their interview. In fact, um, I was going to play it. I ought to find it to let people know where they can go. Um, because um, um, uh, unless you want to do, unless you don't do four hours with me, then I'll play it. But I didn't used to believe you about that until I heard them talk about the high level technology that's a thousand years ahead of us. Um, that these, um, well, you believe that they're the caretakers of the planet, but uh, I believe there's something else. But they got this technology uh, that can actually do that. So. Uh, I really do believe you about the nanotechnology. They got technology so far advanced that who knows how ignorant we actually are, uh, yeah. how primitive we are. Go ahead. Rather than caretakers, they're more custodians. So the one question that comes from people that are waking up is, what about all the nuclear power plants that are going to melt down like Fukushima when they're flooded? All right, It only takes about 90 minutes for one of these nuclear power plants to be to begin melting down once they flood because you have no access to the generators. The power cuts off. There's no generators. There's no way to cool. And then the reactor is uncontrolled. So how is that with 200, about 200 nuclear power plants in the eastern part of the United States? Well, what's going to happen? Well, that's where the custodians come in. And the day of the Lord is about to start. So if you look at prophecy, this key figure, Elijah, He's the key figure of the entire Bible. He's, he is mentioned in the last two verses of the Old Testament. He is the, the subject of Christ's prophecies many times, saying that he's coming to restore all things. He's coming to restore the hearts of the fathers to children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest the Lord come with a curse. That is the last two verses of the Old Testament. And then Christ says that John the Baptist was Elijah, and that and that's in Matthew 11, start at verse 13. And then in verse 7, in chapter 17, after Elijah, John the Baptist, is dead, then Christ says that he's coming to restore all things. That's what's about to happen. He is the prophet of Acts 3, start at verse 22. Well, go back to 19, where heaven is holding Christ by the hand until this character comes. He is coming. He's in the world right now. The aliens are looking for him. The uh, Everybody, the Jews. The American Indians, everybody is looking for this character, this Messiah, whatever you want to call him. He's coming. And the aliens are going to listen to him too, as in the times of old. If you go back to Mesopotamia, if you, if, if you go to um, Halley's uh, Bible handbook and go around, to, it's about page 100, then you'll see the, a listing of kings that ruled on this earth, according to the historical record, up to 48,000 years. Right. 
So during those times, the kingdom of this earth was in Mesopotamia. It's the same ground as Mesopotamia. That's the same land as Iraq, the, the promised land of Genesis 15, verse 18. That is going to be the kingdom that is restored according to Jesus Christ, according to the prophecy of Peter through Moses in Acts 3. All right, That's what's about to happen here, terraforming the planet. It's like tilling your garden. You, you go out there, you're looking at grass, and it's all beautiful and everything. You take, you till it for a garden, you got to tear it up. It's gonna, the earth is going to be purified by water and fire. If you look at the two witnesses that led Israel in the wilderness, there's one a pillar of fire, and there's a pillar of cloud. That pillar of fire and cloud is about to come upon the earth, and it's going to destroy almost everybody. The Georgia Guidestones prophecy is going to come true. And yeah, which, by the way, uh, Terrell, um, just a little known fact, if people want to know just how old this planet is, why do you think that rocks, especially the smaller the rock, the more roundish it is? Think about rocks. Why are they always roundish in nature? And that is because what Terrell's talking about, this earth has been ripped up and these rocks have tumbled uh, over many, many cycles. And that's how they get their roundish nature to them. That just shows you uh, how old the Earth is and how violent it, that it's been uh, before. But go ahead, Terrell. Yeah, I, I think it's more simple than you suggest. I think it, the, the roundness has to do with water and running over a rock that tumbles over a period of time. Water and wind, they're going to be the erosion. You know, they're going to cause the erosion, and that's going to cause until the little rock becomes even littler and then disintegrates into nothing, much like a, a star, that a, a peripheral dwarf. That it's going to be a white dwarf when it begins, and this is going to form with the solar uh, disk, the dust cloud that condenses, rotates. On the periphery, you'll have secondary and tertiary gravitational vortices, and these, th these vortices, they collect dust that, that we will get to after the long break. Yeah, we got, we got a break coming up, five, six minutes, everybody. We'll be right back after this break. Okay, welcome back, folks. Welcome back. You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. You are listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We are listener-supported, actually the biggest non-commercial radio station on the planet, and it's listener-supported. If you just Google Terrell Black Star in YouTube, then you'll get my YouTube channel, and that has uh, descended into a one time per week update 15 minutes on where the black star is earth changes you know and things like that pointing you towards the newsletters where you can get more information and that's at terrell03.com if you're interested in the true interpretation of scripture that includes the three witnesses of god's living word then there's an hour and a half of videos at terrell03.com and then the book the mystery explained it's a pig it's 400 pages, 80 diagrams showing you the different three witness mystery sets in scripture. And um, the 9-11 section is pretty much the same way. Six videos, hour and a half, and um, the truth of 9-11, the, the key wording of the documentation that proved that 9-11 is not only an inside job. It was giant theft, Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, the black operation, um, focus on the Pentagon. What really, you know, what really happened there. And so there's, you can just Google my name in any 9-11 topic and I get more information on that. Right now it's about Project Black Star. Found out about this through the discovery of Elenin, 2011, December 10th, 2010, actually. This investigation began in 2011, right after that book was written about 9-11, after the keywording was done of all the documentation. Then, uh, the realization, with the realization that this was another psychological op that was run by the lettered agencies. That's what got me into this investigation, and now there's a clear pattern. So it's, um, I have to stick with it. This this is where I'm led by God, and this is you know, what I'm, I'm doing. This, I'm sharing the truth, just like with Scripture, just like with 9-11, pressure sheet technology, vapor plasma integrated engines, and um, artificial intelligences, and uh, super soldier programs, the House, House of Rothschild being the culprit. In all these things, and um, that's that's this is my life's work that I spill out here on the radio, you know, for you guys. That the hub of it is at terrell03.com. That's where you can begin your own investigation 
And I want to try to help you to get as much information in, uh, so that you can draw your own conclusions for free. That, you know, I realize the model for the internet and everything has to be for free. That's why there's hours of videos there. But for those that want more, then you subscribe to the newsletter. It's a yearly $25 um, subscription. And then you can email me anytime you have questions about pictures, Second Son pictures, seen thousands of them, and uh, things like that. Then uh, I'm your resource to do your threat assessment, help you to identify safe zone locations or what's about to happen. And uh, before we move on, then Star Trekker had a good question. He wants to know what the effects are going to be during the terraforming of the planet. And the, the effects are going to be the earth is going to be tipped over. Scripture describes it like a drunkard. It's, it, the earth is going to wobble, not like it does now, 23 and a half degrees for the seasons. It's going to truly wobble so that the north pole faces away from the sun and the black star that is reaching perihelion, right? So the earth, the the uh, the crust of the Earth is going to follow Earth metals, particularly magnetite. The distribution of metals within our Earth is it's part of the investigation. It's very important to understand. The, the reason that the North Pole is the North Pole is because the largest magnetite deposit in the world is under the North Pole. You know, right? So if that metal, it, if it moves, then that will be the new mag. That will be the the new North Pole for our planet. Okay, so I do not expect that to happen. But what I do expect to happen is we know that there's a magnetic polarity conflict between our planet and the inbound magnet. So this black star that comes in, it, it has its own magnetic polarity. It affects our planet gravitationally and magnetically primarily. And the gravitational effect is measured at the alignments and the magnetic effect with nearing proximity. So when the Earth is behind the sun, like right now, then we have a diminished influence from the black star. The sun is the, mag is the gigantic magnetic source, the electromagnetic source inside of our solar system. When we're near the black star on the alignment on the near side, which was April the 6th this year, then, then the Earth has more – the I'm sorry, the black star has more influence magnetically. Than when we're on the back side of the sun. So the magnetic pole migration, for example, of the North Pole, the magnetic North Pole, see that accelerates and it slows down. And it actually turns around on itself and then accelerates again and then turns around and backs up. What we see with the modeling is spirals. As the magnetic pole migration increases, we're seeing larger loops as it's happening. And the reason is and you see that the loops create one year cycles, a little bit over one year. Because this object is moving left in the orbit diagram, so the influence for the next year is a little bit later in the orbit diagram. So um, many, many patterns that we're looking at. The magnetic pole migration is one of them. Um, so anyway, the, uh, there are lots of indicators that say that there's something that's coming from space. But at the same time, we're seeing disinformation programs. We're seeing warnings from NASA. We've been getting them. 2011, NASA, they, they gave video warnings to employees and their families to prepare for an unforeseen danger that's coming from space. 2011 with Elenin, okay? The, uh, the, the reason that I got into this, like I was saying earlier, was the keywording of the documentation related to the Elenin investigation. This, uh, this comment, it was, the first hyperbolic comet that was discovered by a Russian, right? Guess what's the second hyperbolic comet that would have been discovered by a Russian if he, if he would have identified it, classified it within the 72-hour time limit? That would have been S1. That would have been the second comet, hyperbolic. Hyperbolic means that it creates a U-shaped. It comes in once, goes around the sun, and leaves and doesn't come back again. And they're, they're kind of rare. Common ice on is, is hyperbolic. It, 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 this is the first time that that comet has come, and it's the last time that it's ever going to come. That's what it means to be hyperbolic. Well, how do okay. they know it's hyperbolic? That's the classification. That these people, that's what they do. They're astronomers. That they are able to predict by various factors the where it came from in space. This is an Oort cloud object. 
it's it comes beyond 100 astronomical units, and it's in the Oort cloud, and it fall, it's going to fall around the sun, be a sun grazer, and it's going to leave, and it's not coming back. It's going to stay out there. So if you look out there at the Oort cloud, you have to realize that almost everything in the Oort cloud is not coming around the sun, you know, in an elliptical orbit to interact directly as a sun grazer. Every, all the objects, they're surrounding us like a cloud. They are out there positioned, orbit around the sun. They have a stable orbit, in other words. Now, the ones that fell out of space, the ones that fell out of orbit from the asteroid belt, the Kuiper belt, and beyond, the scattered disk, then the Oort cloud, they have already fallen out of orbit. Remember that we've been here for 4.4 billion years, this solar system. So early in the solar system, many things fall out of orbit. That's why you look at the moon and you see many craters. That's evidence that there was a lot of things flying around previously. But as the solar system becomes older and older, then there's less and less of this activity. So that's what we're looking at now, a stable environment, a stable Oort cloud, a stable solar disk. It really doesn't happen that way. So th this particular object that we're talking about, Elenin was a Kuiper Belt object, fell out of the Kuiper Belt, 1.84 degrees below the plane, came in 2011, exactly 10 years after 9-11, it reached perihelion, which seems like too much of a coincidence to me. And in my mind, Elenin really was no comet at all. This was disinformation program run by the lettered agencies, part of a desensitizing operation with all these predictions, expectations, and part of my research fed into that. You know, we had many, many, you know, people subscribing back to two years ago, but Ellen and desensitized people. And what went on last year with John Moore, Mike Harris, Kerry Cassidy, remember all the September 26th dates, what's going on right now with the Patty disinfo is September 26th. This is the same dates, and it's desensitizing the people. So the reason that my research and yours is not going to gain approval or, or uh, support is because people are falling asleep from what's happening. And it's pattern. It's like a lullaby. You're being sung to sleep. But by the time that this thing gets here, people are going to be saying peace and safety. They're going to think that there's no black, there's no threat at all. We, we've been able to see the pattern for the last few years, but it's diminishing because of the effect that the black star is having on the sun, taking it out of the game as a major contributor of electromagnetism, basically, is what it is. So I can already see, like you do, Hijacker, a diminished need in society for our kind of research. People are going to think that everything is just a OK -okay by the time it gets there. And it's just going to become more profound and more and more profound as we get there. So you and I are going to be be characterized as, well, nut jobs and the idiots and and uh, people that are just after the money, you know, and things like that. That's what's going to happen to us. And when it gets here, people are going to be surprised. Uh, suddenly, that's what Scripture says. If you go to First Thessalonians chapter 5, start at verse 1, talks about the day of the Lord starting. This is how it starts, right here. There's no prophecy about it because the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. The prophets of the Old Testament were never, ever, ever allowed to see how the day of the Lord began. They are all, see, Daniel, you can go read Daniel, Zechariah. They can tell you, Ezekiel, they can tell you how the day of the Lord ends. That happens when the black star comes the next time. But you see, whenever the black star comes, the earth is in a different position in orbit, like a roulette wheel. There's 365 positions on that roulette wheel, and now you're going to spin it. The Earth can be in many 365 different positions, 1.6 million miles apart as the black star reaches perihelion. And we get a different effect depending on where the Earth is. If we're on the far side of the sun, if we're around here in fall orbit where we are now, and this thing crosses Earth's orbit path, then we go to winter orbit when it goes to summer. We go to spring when it goes to fall and it leaves. The sun is between us the whole time. We get a different effect than if we are in summer orbit when it reaches perihelion and it's between the Earth and the Sun. You see what I mean? So you, you cannot use the Sumerian text to tell you what's going to happen because the Sumerians only lived through a few orbit cycles. It could have been winter orbit cycles. They don't even know what can happen if the Earth is in the wrong place. And that's what happens when the Wormwood um, scenario takes place from Revelation. 
the, the Earth is so close to the black star that the Earth interacts with one of its orbitals. Because this is a mini solar system that we're talking about, a binary twin to our sun. This binary twin was much larger than our sun. The reason that we've been here 4.4 billion years and we've only evolved this far is because life could not exist on this planet so long as the binary twin to our sun continued to live. Because as it interacts with the sun every now and then, 3,600 years, then it burns off too much energy is coming off that sun, so it kills back any life that begins. But once the binary twin, see, larger binary stars, larger suns, they burn out much faster, much larger surface area, much ability to burn off. So the larger suns, like our binary twin, burned off, and then it can collapse upon itself and imploded, supernova. Now, whenever you get a supernova like this, you can get a spectrum of results. You can get something... It's it's like a diamond. This is the way I've explained it on other shows. It's like a it's like the carbon deposits inside the earth from organic material. It can be compressed to create coal, or it can be compressed to create a diamond. But it depends on the pressure and time. Well, binary stars are the same way. Pressure and time is going to be is going to tell you the result. You can get a white dwarf, brown dwarf, black dwarf as a binary twin, depending on the pressure. Now, a peripheral dwarf is different. A peripheral dwarf forms with the, that's what we were talking about before the break. A, a peripheral dwarf, the first brown dwarf, for example, was discovered in our solar system in 1995. It's a transitional dwarf. It began as a white dwarf. It transitioned. The reason is because all stars shed their skin, their outer skin. But these dwarf family of stars, they have no ignition. You must have a certain amount of mass to have ignition like our sun, like our binary twin. These peripheral dwarfs have insufficient mass. So they form as a secondary and tertiary gravitational vortex. The, our sun was formed at the core of a, vor, a vortex, okay, gravitational. As the subatomic, as the dust gathered and rotated as it fell into the drain, if you will, okay, then our sun ignited because it had sufficient mass, which stopped the implosion process. But a peripheral dwarf does not have sufficient mass to, to implode and ignite, so it continues to implode. As it does, the gravity well becomes deeper and deeper. The dust, the subatomic particles, the, the dust rushing to the, the bottom of that well, the, the subatomic, the, they collide together, collide, collision, collision, creating heat breaking apart the subatomic particles, breaking all the bonds till so protons, neutrons, electrons, subatomic particles releases photons are rushing to the bottom of this well. Okay, that's what happens. Now, the protons are larger, the largest subatomic particle group. They bang together more often and they slow down. The velocity decreases. Neutrons are the second, second in size. They bang together less frequent, but more frequent than electrons, which are much, much, much smaller. Subatomic particles that are released as photons are even smaller than electrons. They find the center, the bottom of that gravity well first, and they gather together as a ball. Then the electrons come along. They gather around like a tree ring, kind of. Okay. Then the neutrons come in. They are the slower in velocity. They create a a covering of the electrons, and then the protons get there last, moving the slowest. They cover the outside. Okay, now the white star is formed, and the white star begins releasing its skin, outer skin, as protons only. Okay, and the white star is more visible than the brown and the black dwarfs. Okay, but as the all the protons, we're talking about billions of years of evolution, goes by, then the outer skin is shed down to the neutrons. Right now you have a brown dwarf, and then you get down to the electrons, and then you have what's a black dwarf. Our solar system is not currently old enough to support a black dwarf star. You see what I mean? Because it's transitional. However, a binary twin to our sun can be compressed. So the reason, oh, let me give you a little bit of background. A, a dwarf star that is 50% uh, larger than Earth is half the mass of our sun. Because, you see, our sun subatomic particles are not compressed together. Earth subatomic particles are not compressed together. Regular atomic structure. These dwarf stars are different. They have all the subatomic particles pushed together. 
So that's like filling our entire solar system to Pluto orbit with Plutos. Okay, that's going to give you a super high dense mass object. Okay, hang on, hang on, Terrell. We're, we're going to be back in just about two minutes. So you get the newsletter, go to terrell03.com, click on 2013, get the Dropbox folder link, and then you have access. Volume number 41 is what went out this week, and um, accumulation of information from you know from a lot of different sources, and pretty much saying the same thing that there is something coming out of the Virgo constellation, Earth changes. Um, we look at the patterns, what's going on, but I do not see the dramatic need. This is the 2013 orbit cycle. I know we have a 2014 orbit cycle and a partial 2015 orbit cycle, and that could change to something that's even longer. It's possible, but uh, the idea that this thing is right upon us right now, that's just not possible. So where we are right now, yeah, but is, so wait, wait a minute, Terrell. Now you—it's not we, possible. Hi, right, it's not possible. Right. But you say we got a big shaker coming up. So let's say in the next two days, that's your window for the alignment for the Earth on the back side of the Sun, which is lined up with the uh, black dwarf star. So you got that straight line. Um, I do believe what you're saying is true. But what happens if the big eight or eight point five or the, you know the big one comes in ten days from now? Good question. What that means, because that could happen, what that means is that the object is farther left in the orbit cycle than we thought. So instead of being, you know, just underneath the tail of Virgo, just below the plane, then it's closer to Libra. And it can only get to the left side of Libra before it crosses Earth orbit path. So if something like that happens, then I will, you know, give out the warning. But so far, right now, it still appears. So there's my ability, like I said in the newsletter, in the video, my ability to create superior predictive models is diminishing. Now, some aspects are working good. The caldera is bulging, for example. The, the out west, the Yellowstone caldera is bulging right when it's supposed to. When we're, a, we're coming into alignment on the back side. So we cross this orbit path on the near side around May the 20th. We go to outside orbit on July the 7th. Then we are in alignment on October the 10th. But just leading up to that, we're in the headlights of this thing. And that's whenever we experience the most bulging in the calderas. And that's the news. That's in the newsletter for this week. The Yellowstone caldera is bulging 10 inches. So that, then that some of the things, outside orbit position, that means – Let's imagine for a second together that where the black star is on the orbit diagram is the nose of an eagle and the beak is pointing straight at the Virgo constellation. Well, the tail, you see, on the back side is where we're entering right now, October the 10th. Where the wings point out, that's outside orbit position. That's the Earth moving to outside orbit on the summer side and the winter side. That is July the 7th, and we know those dates because that's the least number of indicator quakes. The 164 we had in that week, the high number for the year was 341. We know where the minimum is going to be. It's very predictable. So there are some things on the, the charts, on the seismic charts particularly, that are working exactly as predicted and some things that are not working exactly as predicted. On the high end of the chart, we should have had more 7 magnitude quakes through this period like last year. We had about 7 or 8 or 9 7 magnitude quakes in a 90-day period. When we're in the headlights of the thing, they didn't show up as prevalent this year. So I've, what I'm showing is a dip in the uptick period that was pronounced on the front side. If you remember right after Solomon Island hijacker doing these radio shows, then um, on the front side, we, we have this uptick. We went for the indicator quakes that I'm talking about, 146 on the low side in the winter. We predicted the week that it happened, December 28th, and then they started escalating, going upwards, 181, 221, 292. But then all of a sudden after Solomon Island, February the 6th, they started going down again, down to the lowest number of the year, 107. That's impossible in an uptick period. So I'm telling you there's something strange happening here that is impossible for me to build a model to predict. It's impossible. Some things are right. Some things are not right. It has to do with the dynamic going on out there in space. The magnetic portal connections, they're tangling together. There's cross-firing between the connections. We're, 
what I, I believe is happening, we're seeing energy loops, loops. In other words, electromagnetism coming through the primary magnetic portal connection to our planet. Very predictable on 11-year to 12-year cycles, going back in time over than 100 years until now. There's something strange happening out there. Energy is being redirected, and it has to do with these magnetic portal connections, I am sure, but apparently they're twisting together. They're creating loops, so the energy coming from the sun to the earth is being redirected through another magnetic portal connection. Energy that was coming for the 2010-2011 orbit cycle directly from the black star earth magnetic portal connection, that energy is now being redirected somehow, some way. I don't know exactly how or how that's even possible, but it's showing up in the data. So what I'm saying is this low period that's happening in the uptick periods it appears to be accentuating, becoming longer, so that the uptick periods uh, are becoming negligible. It's 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 hard for me to start a radio series warning you guys whenever I've got a dip in the middle of my uptick period. That's what's happening. So this thing is coming and it's insidious. It, the last two years were easier to predict than the coming year. Okay, so uh, yes, I expect to see our high magnitude event that's coming up. I expect to see X class flares. Even they're M now. They're they should transition. If it happens a week later, it means the object's farther left in the orbit diagram. Um, the the path that it is that it has right now coming out of Leo in 2010, 2011, moving into Virgo, transitioning into Libra, crossing Earth orbit path. That is a dangerous scenario. It means that the Earth is near its orbit path. Whenever the, the black star crosses the Earth orbit, the Earth is in near proximity. Now, I, what I would love to see is the, the seismic chart to change so that the outside orbit positions and the alignments pointed at different directions so that we are not in a bad position in 2015. That's what I would love to see. So I do see that the modeling is fluctuating, but... It's not changing the May 20th date because the outside orbit position dates are still constant and they're moving by about 15 degrees, 15 days, 365 days in a year, 360 degrees in a circle, right? So they're moving about 15 degrees or 15 days right now, very predictable. And as long as outside orbit position remains constant, then I have to, well, look at my modeling as if, there is something, a dynamic that's happening that's changing things near the alignments. So um, May the 15th, May the 20th, 2015 is the date that it appears this thing is going to cross Earth orbit. If this thing happens a week later, it means it's closer than I think, and it means it crosses Earth orbit sooner, which could be good news. If the Earth is around, if it changes six months, that would be great. Because then we're on the opposite side of the solar system when it crosses Earth orbit. We go to winter orbit, it goes to summer, and it leaves the solar system while we're in spring. That's good. So we have minimal effect. But somehow, because of knowing, well, Bible prophecy, the Sumerian text, I don't think that we're going to get, e get off easy th at the start of the day of the Lord. I see a ter terraforming event happening. So the question from Star Trekker in the chat room over there is, uh, about building your own shelter in your backyard, going underground. And unfortunately, that's not going to work. Unless you have an elaborate um, air intake cooling system, because outside temperatures are expected to be above 200 degrees for up to eight hours during the peak period, the focus being on noon, noontime, right? So if the air outside is 200 degrees and you're, you're bringing in air to breathe, then the air inside is going to be 200 degrees if you have a small volume. So if you're inside of a large cavern, then the outside temperature can be 200, 300 degrees, and the inside temperature is still going to be around 60 degrees. You see what I mean? So that's the reason that a survival, you need to be part, if you're truly, truly trying to survive the terraforming events that's going to happen, then you need to think like the elites, and you need to be thinking about underground and with a survival group. This is not something you do by yourself or with your family. You have to be part of a survival group because even if you build the perfect shelter in your backyard that can sustain you, what happens when you come out? Is Mad Max going to be waiting there for you? 
Or is there going to be nobody there to support you? Nobody. Everybody's dead. What's, you know, it's going to, or is it going to be something in between? The, the thing to do is to think through all the threats, create yourself the envi- correct environment with the correct survival group and work from there. So for example, I'm not telling you guys what to do, but I'm telling you what I have done. I moved from Florida to the Ozarks to Arkansas. And I made myself available as a caretaker, and I worked on a large property with a cavern, large enough cavern, and invited survival group members there, right? So lived there for almost two years, helping the locals with the uh, problems of scale on tomato plants and showing them how to extend the life of their, you know, to get greater yield from the the gardening and developing. Oh, yeah, just to, just to mention a little factoid, uh, Terrell. Uh, this guy, uh, he could grow tomato plants like, oh, 12 foot high, maybe more than that. He would harvest like um, something like over 2,000 pounds of tomatoes. Uh, he, he's in the world record. Uh, you ought to see what, you know, what he did with just one tomato plant. But, uh, yeah. no, there's lots of stuff you can manipulate uh uh, and, and, you know, put in an environment which it can produce the most. Go ahead. That's exactly right. And I'm in the league with the fella. And using, we use about 19 tomato plants actually. And we grew them above five, above three feet. We built a trellis system. And we were picking tomatoes from over our heads. That's the only way to beat the scale disease that's prevalent in the Ozarks, by the way. So um, that's just part of the research of extending your capabilities in, you know, working truly part of a survival strategy to survive the black star, what's coming. When you neutralize the black star threats, you neutralize all the threats. That's, you know, I've been a survivalist for years. And black star created the need to improve my abilities in the garden and in uh, firearms and then all aspects of survival, water purification, you know, every aspect, right? So whenever you neutralize those threats, you develop, you gather together the right survival group. The right survival group is going to represent a cross-section of your society. You're going to have doctors. You're going to have military contingent, nurses, caretakers, teachers. You know, you're going to have hands that help your people and a core group and a perimeter group of, of military people. And that's the perfect the description of the the uh, survival group that has a better than 50 percent chance of of success, right? It's going to be in the central part of the United States. You're going to eliminate everything east of the Mississippi River Basin because of the nuclear power plants. You're going to eliminate everything west of the Rocky Mountain Ridge because of the calderas, the outgassing that's going to take place, right? So you're going to be in the central part of the United States. And you have to move south because the outgassing of the calderas is going to cover the northern part of the central United States. So you're looking at the Ozarks where John Moore is, where there are multiple underground uh, Ark City facilities. That's why I chose to go there. Uh, There's about a seven-state area that's the perfect safe zone for the northern um, Americas, if you will, and the southern hemisphere um, all around. If if you go back and look at history, you look at Columbus, Pizarro, you you look at the discoverers, they had to rediscover the Southern Hemisphere, basically. And that happens because of the Black Star and because of the magnetic polarity conflict that we're talking about. So if you look in the historical precedent, you see if you go to poleshift.com, for example, there's examples of the Earth being flipped around. There's examples of three – the prophecies state that there's about 72 hours of darkness – 72 hours that the sun doesn't shine. Well, that can be caused by the black star coming between the earth and the sun and the magnetic polarity conflict that tips the earth over. So the southern hemisphere faces the sun and the black star to be destroyed. The northern hemisphere is on the dark side of the earth facing away, having 72 hours of darkness until the the worst effect of the black star passes. You see, so the historical precedent the uh that's part of the gauge for my survival strategy the uh the uh the effects neutralizing the effects of the black star then you're going to be in a remote location you're going to be far away from mad max if you guys should know what mad max is that's when society collapses and the gangs take over so if you're in a 
let's say, a large city and you're near the coast, you're in the worst possible place that a human being can be for the terraforming events that's about to take place. Whenever the Earth tips over because of the metals, the water is going to follow the law of gravity. So the waters are going to crawl up on the land, you know, for hundreds of miles up into the, you know, on the east coast of the Appalachian Mountains up to, say, 650 to 1,000 feet above sea level. You need to be above, my view, above 1,000 feet above sea level because, the, I mean, the Navy is going to give you, just Google the Navy map of the future. They're going to show you the coastlines eroded, the giant calderas bulging and breaking out west, the uh, giant inland gulf in the, where the R- Mississippi River Basin is now, and you need to be on the west side of that because of the nuclear power plants on the east side. See, so the, uh, that's free threat assessment report for everybody in the United States. Yeah, but Terrell, listen, wouldn't they, you know, the, uh, the reason why I believe they're going to they're gonna do a false flag on the electrical grid and blame it as an act of God on a solar flare, by the way, they've shut all those instruments down, now we can't see nothing, uh, NOAA's shut down, NASA's shut down, the Hubble shut down, they're just shutting down everything. Um, I'm thinking they're going to do a false flag saying a solar flare hit us, and then take that opportunity to basically shut the power grid down and then just using them sparsely where they just rolling blackout type deal. You know, doesn't that make sense to you or what they would do? Yes, but later in the timeline, 2013, we're two years ahead of 2015, Orbit Cycle. What you're seeing now is training. But yes, the new, there's two nuclear power plants in Arkansas, for example, that's where we're going to get our power as our survival group. We know that they feed the underground bunkers that are there that are built by the elite. And so we're in near proximity. We're, that's where we're going to get our power from. So that's part of our survival strategy. Now, that works on a stable tectonic plate. What That's in the central part of the United States, stable, right? Eastern United States is not stable. That You have fault lines over there that the Americans don't even know exist. East of the the Appalachian Ridge, the, there's a fault that from the New Madrid that runs across North Carolina into that fault system that runs up through, up through New England. So once the New Madrid goes, and it's going to go, then 2011, then the training exercises was about the New Madrid popping. That is going to happen, right? But what's going to happen then after that is once the, these tectonic plates begin moving, then you're going to create the space. The, the tectonic line running from the New Madrid over to this, the other fault system that I'm telling you about, it's totally inactive now, but it is going to become active from Georgia all the way up to New England. And the entire Rocky Mountain Ridge is going to shake. The entire eastern seaboard is going to shake violently. Far, far, far too many nuclear power plants in that scenario. So the prevailing wind northeast tells you you've got to get out of there. It, as far as being in your safe zone, so west of the Mississippi River Basin is where you're going to have to be whenever catastrophe strikes. But you see, half of the effort, I was describing this to a subscriber from California, half of the effort is, is pre- preparation, getting prepared, getting your survival group together. Then I mean, you, you don't have to buy property in the Ozarks. You can just know where a cavern is, a large cavern. And you have a campground nearby where your survival group meets. And you should meet them there on each orbit cycle in preparation for what you're about to do. Because you're going to be standing outside those doors whenever crap hits the fan. Because the people that own that cavern, I've shook hands with lots of cavern owners in the Ozarks. They're going to want help. And you're going to be there as a resource for them to use to defend. You see, so being at the right place at the right time, recognizing the pattern... And utilizing my threat assessment, I'm going to tell you when to be, where to be, and when to be, right? So you it, you don't need vast amount of resources. You just got to be smart, and you got to work together with a survival group, and be at the right place at the right time when catastrophe strikes. And the way that looks right now is 2015. What you're looking at in May of 2015, to be exact. What you're looking at now is government shutdowns. The government in the United States is eventually going to shut down permanently, but it is not now. This is too early. This is a training exercise. Okay, well, this is this is the point, uh, Terrell. 
We know that Christmas season, from Black Friday right after Thanksgiving to Christmas, basically the retail industry uh, of our country makes 50% of their profit. Uh, that is the make or break season. Everybody knows that. That's the law of economics. That's the way it works. You know, they tread water for 11 months, and then when Christmas comes, boom, that's when they make all their cash. If they keep on going with this shutdown, uh, playing these games all the way up to the 17th of October, that's going to mess up the Christmas season. Irreversible devastation to the uh, economic infrastructure as far as commercial real estate is concerned. And so what I'm saying, if, if they go for another week and they don't fix this problem, then it becomes irreversible, which is going to trigger a deep recession or even a depression. And so why would they trip into this economic devastation so early? Uh, go ahead. They're not. The, the, the U.S. economy, which is what you're talking about, the reason that the U.S. economy is so important is because the American dollar is the world's reserve currency. That's why it has hyper importance. Okay. But the, the economy began the collapse in September, September 18th, 2008. If you go back in history, look at the history books, then you're going to see Bernanke and Paulson showing up with three and a half pages of proposed legislation for the House of Representatives. Remember, every bill that problem that is solved in the United States through the government that includes appropriations must begin with the House of Representatives. Right. Well, the, wait a minute, Terrell. We've got QE1, QE2, QE3, and that's QE... Spawn from TARP-1, which was part of what I'm talking about. Right. TARP-2, and then now we're in quantitative easing to infinity, and the financing of American debt through the back door of the Fed. The back door of the Fed, the Federal Reserve, has been financing uh, the, the silver shore position for J.P. Morgan. They've been financing corporations around the world that have been on the collapse. The true collapse happened in September of 2008. That's when massive trillions of dollars changed hands. Everything was going to implode. That's why Paulson and Bernanke showed up in the first place. Okay, the, Then the actual collapse took place in March of 2009 when the Dow hit about 6,500. But that's when quantitative easing starting, which was what you're talking about. These are the same people that murdered Americans on 9-11 and stole trillions of dollars. But they realize they don't need to murder Americans. They can just pass the legislation through the corrupt politicians. That's what quantitative easing is. So trillions of dollars are being diverted through quantitative easing to all these different avenues. But what they're trying to do is make everything appear okay. That's what they've been doing during the collapse because they do not want to create additional threats as they're getting ready to run to the underground arc cities. Now, here's their problem. They've got sleepers everywhere. They've got people in the CIA, in the military, right, in the government that are not going to the underground arc cities. There's not room for them. So there's people on the inside, and there's people sitting right next to them right now that are being deployed into harm's way as sleepers. That's what I call them anyway. Now, you have to have training exercises for sleepers. You have to get them ready. That's earthquake drills, solar flare drills, all kinds of drills. You got to get them ready to run right into harm's way. The government shutdown is a drill. That's what's happening. They should have shut down the government in 2008. The, the United States is in debt over 200 trillion dollars, going to 300 trillion dollars. They're talking about 700 trillion, like it means something, but that's a lie. Unfunded liabilities is is like 130 trillion, right? The combined wealth of all Americans is about 80 to 90 trillion. With the with the uh, depreciation of your real estate, it's really shrinking quickly. So just the unfunded liability bill, just what you're giving to people on welfare, you can't pay, much less the real bills. Okay, so they know that already. Every American should be aware of that already. The the biggest problem in America is worker displacement. You have through the NAFTA type treaties, you, you're competing with people working for a dollar a day, NAFTA treaties. You have the HB1 people. All the visa programs are bloated. Too many foreign nationals coming in, taking Amer uh, jobs from Americans. You have illegal aliens here, more than 20 million of them. They are taking jobs. This is displacing one American from a job that has to displace another American from a job. Competition is 
is sending the wages downward, which means less consumer base, less tax base, less social services. At the same time, when American uh, illegal aliens are killing about 25 Americans every day. Okay, 10,000 Americans a year die from people that are not even supposed to be here. And they're talking about legislating uh, amnesty again with more reform whenever they're not enforcing the Immigration and Reform Act of 1986. You already have perfect immigration laws. Anybody found guilty of giving an illegal alien the appearance of legal working status is guilty of a five-year felony right now. But nobody's enforcing the law. So they're, nobody's enforcing the law, so they're saying, well, we need new laws. No, they're going to give more people amnesty and kick open the back door and displace more Americans from jobs because the point is to destroy the American consumer base and the tax base. And that's what they're doing in slow motion. But Americans are so stupid they don't even realize it, like 9-11 attacks. So we're going to go into a low period here. And the, de the desensitizing program that is in place right now is going to take effect. There's going to be fewer and fewer people that are willing to listen to have their eyes open to what's coming from space on the next orbit cycle. It's going to decrease. The maximum number of people that were actually waking up to what's going on was in 2011. And then 2012, you see how that worked. Lettered agencies ran that disinformation program for many years, 2012. I mean, it was a movie. And nothing happened. That was a galactic plane hypothesis. That was not true. Nothing happened. And there's these warnings with S1 that are happening now, very similar to Elenin. So there's so many parallels between S1, which is a comet that came out of cancer. Now it's migrating over into Leo. It's, it's in the same sector of space as the Black Star, actually. But it's, there's so many similarities that from S1, the second hyperbolic comet discovered by Russia. Right, but this is a, a terrible. Let me just cut in. S1, there's, there's astronomers, there's people now on Earth with telescopes that are Francis Walsh. He used to be here. Um, he's taking pictures from his observatory. Uh, he's back in the game. You know, he's actually got pictures of it. We know this thing's got a tail. It's not like Comet Elenin which nobody even photographed. It just kind of disintegrated, got a couple grainy videos from NASA, and it was basically made up as far as I'm concerned. But this, this S1, uh, Common Ison, uh, we can actually see. You can see it. Yeah, and it's also said to be controlled. If you go to March 1st, 2011, you see the Russians warned about Elenin being controlled. And now the second hyperbolic comet discovered by Russia is said to be controlled, too. Now, you're not going to find another comet in between Elonen and S1 that was said to be controlled. In other words, th these, these objects that are falling from space, they should follow predictable, extremely very predictable paths, velocities, in their orbits around the sun. And S1 staggered much like Elonen did as it's coming in. But S1 is unlike Elenin in that Elenin was just below the plane 1.84 negative. This one is positive 62 degrees. That's a lot. That's a, that's a big number. In other words, this is an Oort cloud object. It is not from the scattered disk or the Kuiper belt or the asteroid belt. It is, is from far out in space. And it's coming in at a steep angle, very, very high. It does not interact with the planets. Um, like every other Oort cloud object, Lovejoy 2012, for example, the negative declination I think was 167 or 162 degrees, something like that. But these Oort cloud objects do not interact with the planets because of the steep angles that they come in. The chances of having an Oort cloud object that's coming in near the plane is almost zero because we're it's a cloud. It, we're surrounded by them, so it's going to be a, a positive big number or or a you know, a big low number. So once this thing comes, which now it's inside of Mars orbit, October the 1st, it's going to cross Earth orbit around November the 1st. It's going to dive below the plane on November the 5th inside of Earth orbit. And then it's going to go below the sun relative to the Earth, to the Earth. then reach perihelion nearest the sun, maximum velocity over a million miles an hour behind the sun relative to relative to Earth. See, so as it's passing below the sun, if it creates a solar flare, that's going to be in the southern hemisphere. 
it's not going to be Earth directed. It's impossible to be Earth directed. Then on the back side of the sun, reaching perihelion, when it's near the sun, that's also impossible to be Earth directed. Any solar flare is going to be in the opposite. It's going to go towards the opposite side of the solar system. Then as this thing comes above the sun and then above Earth orbit, Earth is going to cross its orbit path. It's, it's around December the 15th, if memory serves, and it's going to be about 0.44 astronomical units away, way far above Earth's orbit path, which is common for an Oort cloud object. But the point is that Earth is never in a bad position. Earth is in a good position all the time for S1, all the time. This thing cannot interact with our planet at all. It's impossible. Even if it fractured and came apart, the Earth is in an advantageous position throughout the orbit of this object. If it's going to crash and come apart, then it's going to be leading up to perihelion. Let's say it would be a week before it reached perihelion. That would be around November the 21st, 22nd, something like that. Elenin came in and was said to be destroyed, to fracture, come apart about a week before perihelion. I expect to see the same kind of cover story. Because when this thing comes around the sun, I am not expecting to see a gigantic, magnificent tail like Halley's Comet. I'm not expecting to see that. So they're going to, they have to have some kind of type of story. And what they came up with Elenin was that it was destroyed or it, it fractured and came apart, reaching perihelion. But remember that about half, almost half of all comets that come out of the Kuiper Belt, Scattered Disk, and the Oort Cloud, they, they are stretched apart. The, because they're made basically of thane stuff, ethane, methane, of water, which is ice. And as they get near the sun, then the, the leading edge, especially if it's a larger comet like S1, then the leading edge is pulled so much with so much more velocity. It's pulled apart much more greater than the rear edge of the comet. So the, the comet is stretched into a straight line. That's what happens with comets as they're reaching perihelion, especially sun grazers, especially large ones that are fractured. Now, NASA, nobody can tell you what's going to happen because they do not know the the uh, consistency. They do not know the compaction. They don't know how well established, how well the, the nucleus of this object is compacted together. So it could just be stretched apart, be a dud, or it can hold together, come around, and create a tail. So the, the little tail that you're talking about is just a little bar-shaped tail that is common for comet reaching perihelion as they're coming in. They, they do not develop the nice curved tail until after they get nearest the sun, after they have time to interact with the solar wind. That would happen after November 28th, leading up to the time that it crosses Earth orbit, leaving the inner solar system on December the 15th. So it's, during, it's in that window that we have the opportunity to have a magnificent tail and a spectacle, a light show, that some are saying will be 13 times more bright than the moon, okay, which, you know, all that seems to me at this point in the orbit cycle of this comet to be mere speculation because nobody knows, nobody knows. But why is there so much news about S1? Why is there talk about it being controlled? You're looking more from a political analyst point of view and trying to decipher the geopolitical information from a geopolitical point of view. So, what I'm going to do is look at it from a, more of a scientific astronomer point of view. And S1 is no threat to our planet whatsoever. Don, the astronomer that owns his own observatory, he agrees. And we just laugh at the disinformation that you guys are seeing on the what Internet. What about the solar flares that the sun has fired out? One of them was so big, we got hit with the left side of it. There's three that went as far as Mars. And we got hit about three or four days ago. No. Right. Go that's ahead. anticipated. We've already said that's going to happen. The, so remember that S1 is entering the sector of space with the black star. So it started in Cancer. Now it's moving through Leo. And then it's going to come through Virgo relative from Earth, how we're looking through the solar system. Okay. So it's crossing the same sector of space as the black star. The flares you're talking about are not created by S1. S1 has to be very, very near the sun inside of Mercury orbit before the solar flare effect is going to take, before that's going to happen. But the magnetics of the black star, the magnetic portal connection, that's what's causing the solar flares. Okay, looks like I'm back on the air, folks. Sorry about that. Uh, technical difficulty. 
Um, I should get Terrell back uh, any minute. Um, sorry about that. <clears throat> I tried to answer a call from Nighthawk, and it didn't go. It didn't go well. It says I'm running live, uh, so I'm just kind of waiting to see what what the deal is. Wow, what a way to end. I mean, what in the world? Okay. Already did, already re-added Terrell. He dropped out. He says everything's going to be, um, we got the bump in the road and everything's going to be okay. And let me just see. Yeah, he killed. Yeah, he killed a Skype. So I guess he's going to bed. <laughs> 